created by Rio Grande. Offenders police calling all cars. Attention all cars. Broadcast 191 regarding a holdup. Suspect described as male American, 24 years. 5 feet 8 or 9 inches, 145 pounds. Dark hair and eyes. Wore a gray overcoat and cap. This man is dangerous. That's all. Throws and takes. Again, and I'll shoot you dead. Uh, what do you want? This is a pickup. 
little object resting on your spare box is a gun. Ever see one? Yeah. Okay, pal. Hand over what you got. You won't get very much. This, this has been a kind of a poor rig. Well, you got paid today, didn't you? Yeah, but I don't carry that around with me. Okay, give me what you have. Well, here's two bucks and here's two fifty cent pieces and two tokens. And here's what's in the changer. That makes about fifteen dollars and all. All right. Let me off at the next stop. Keep buttoned up, pal, and you won't get hurt. And don't look around. Don't worry, I won't. Five days later, shortly before two o'clock in the morning, officers James Costello and Elmer Hoffman were patrolling the district of Los Angeles near West 7th and Lucas Street. I hear the boys down at Georgia are a little worried about that streetcar holdup last week. Yeah. Can't seem to get a line on that bird. Hanson furnished a pretty good description last December. Huh? Well, I got a good one from Fuller. The man he held up on the 25th. Anybody see his face in either job? No. Fuller got a fair look. Everybody identified the overcoat and cap, though. Well, if he's still in Los Angeles, we'll find him, all right. Oh, he's probably in Timbuktu by this time, yeah. <laughs> hey, take it a little slower, Elmer. There's a mug sitting in an automobile. Don't look so good at this time of night. Turn around, Elmer. I'm going to ask this boy some questions. Okay, Jim. Take it easy now. You never can tell about these mugs. He's probably waiting for that chop story joint to close. That's what's the idea, bud. Waiting for somebody? What's it to you? Uh, nothing special. Just thought this is a peculiar time to be sitting in a car in a public street like this. Anything wrong in that? Well, it all depends. Suppose you get out and let's take a look at you. I've been sort of looking for a gray coat and cap like that. Okay, cop. Now get this. Huh? Get back in that baby carriage there and beat it. Get me? Make it fast. I ain't fooling. Okay, bud. You don't have to poke that gun through me, you know. Go on. Shut off. All right. You'll have to move over, Elmer. He's got the drop on me. What's up, Jim? The monkey's got a gun on me, Elmer. Move over. Lean back, Jim. Let me get a shot at him. Oh, oh, hi. Why, why you? Oh. Elmer, I'm hit. Get him. Hey! Stop! In an effort to get out of the car and at the same time assist his brother officer, Hoffman was unable to get a good shot at the fleeing bandit or to obtain a glimpse of his license. There followed hours of feverish activity on the part of the police. Additional officers were added to details, checking parking lots, garages, out-of-the-way storage lots, searching for the bandit's car. Next day, in the office of Chief of Detectives Edwards, police officers on duty and off met for a conference. Fellas, we've got to find this bird that shot Jim Costello. Now, we know he lives somewhere around that district. And here's my suggestion. Let's map out that section in blocks. Let's all take a section and canvas it in plain clothes. We'll tell those mugs that run some of those places that if we don't find out within 12 hours who killed Costello, we'll really mess up that district. How's about it? Okay, Steve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well? Listen, Gertie. You like living here, don't you? Sure. What about it? Well, I've been hearing tales about this place. Wouldn't like to go down to headquarters and try to prove they aren't true, would you? Sure not. I ain't hankering to go to the cop house. And well, I'm looking for a bird who shot a cop out here last night. If we hear from him inside of 12 hours, we won't need to come back through here looking for him. You get me? Sure. I get you. Be seeing you, Gert. Got a cop. You know him? I don't know who you're talking about. Who are you? Never mind. 
Ask the boys in the back room how they'd like to ride in the patrol wagon. Now, wait a minute. You got me wrong. I ain't... I know. You're not running the speakeasy. I'm not standing here either. Now, listen to me. You don't want to have to vacate quick. Get the word around that we'll be waiting at headquarters tonight for a phone call about that mug who's so handy with a rod. And if that phone don't ring... Hey, you. Keep away from that car. Listen, my good man. Don't talk to me that way. I might arrest you. Oh, gee. <laughs> I'm sorry, Captain. I, I, I didn't know who you was. Oh, it. I'm looking for bullet holes, see? Yeah, yeah, I see. Well, uh, you won't find any nice cars. Well, maybe not. And then again... You don't happen to know anything about a car with some bullet holes in it, do you? No, sir, I, I don't. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll wait at headquarters until 12 tonight. You look around and see if you can find a blue-green Dodge Roadster with a dark top, will you? Uh, yes, sir. And don't forget to call me. Uh. Oh, yeah, 
Here it is. What's the first name? Lance. Oh. Discharged for inefficiency in December of last year. Mm-hmm. How about Kroger? C-R-E, C-R-O. Mm-hmm. Oh, Kroger. Conductor on our line. Works out of Division 2. I'll call him. Now, you get me superintendent of Division 2. We can find out when he comes through town. What's he done? Nothing that we know of. Rogers is the man who shot Costello last night. No. Wait a minute. Hello? Well, this is George Buffett. Well, when does Herman Kruger do it at and Spring? Okay. Have a relief man there. That's all. All right, boys. We'll go down and meet the gentleman. <laughs> taken off his car at Seven and Spring, and without a word being spoken to him, was taken to the Georgia Street Station. Captain Edwards and Lieutenant Charles began questioning him. We want to know where you took Glenn Rogers. I don't know any Glenn Rogers. Ah, don't try to hand us that. We happen to know that you got a call from Rogers, and that you went to his house at two o'clock this morning and helped him move. Now, where'd you take him? I didn't help him move, Dorothy. Who's Dorothy? That's his girlfriend. Oh, so you do know Rogers. Well... Yeah, I know him. A little. Where is he now? Plenty of business. Oh, is that so? Now, listen, Mug. Anytime a guy kills a copper, it's a whole lot of my business, see? Now, you come across. I ain't telling you nothing. <laughs> Why, you... Take it easy, Jim. Let me talk to this bird. Now, listen, Kroger. You're in a spot. You're guilty of compounding a felony in that you're helping conceal a felon. And you're guilty of helping him escape. Now, there are two sides to this thing, the right one and the wrong one. You're on the wrong side, Grover, and I'm giving you just five minutes to get right. That is, unless you want me to lock you up now. Uh, wait a minute. Now. Got me wrong. I'll tell you all about it. All right, that's more like it. Get started. Well, Rogers called me early this morning, and I went over to his place in eighth and secret. He told me he shot a copper, and another copper shot him. He said he did it because he didn't want to be caught with a gun on him. Yeah, pretty weak excuse for killing a man. Yeah, that's what I told him, but he said that was his affair. He asked me to call Dorothy, that's his girlfriend, and I did. When they went out to her house, all I did was help him pack a little black handbag with some personal stuff, like shirts and things like that. Where did they go? I don't know the address, but I can show you. All right, come on and do it. Jim, get that. Let's drive Kroger over to the place he says Rogers is hiding. Where is this place, Kroger? It's out in Huntington Park. Well, that's the house over there, the okay. yellow one. Now, you stay here. Derek, you take that side window on the right. Okay, Captain. Derek, you take the back door. I'll go in the front way. Keep your eyes open. Just open it up. We're looking for Glenn Rogers. We ain't here. Never mind, I see him. All right, Rogers, stick him up. Come on in, Jim. What'd you do with the gun, Rogers? I threw it away. But Rogers had not thrown the gun away. After hours of questioning, he finally admitted that he had hidden the gun used to shoot Officer James Costello on the night of March 30th. He was held to answer on a charge of murder and brought to trial in Department 25, the court of Judge Charles W. Fricky. Months dragged by. And at last, the verdict of the jury is ready. The clerk will read the verdict. Case of the people of the state of California versus Glenn Rogers, defendant. We, the jury, find the defendant in the above entitled action not guilty. Uh, <laughs> order, order, order in the court. This is no laughing matter. The jury is discharged. Judge Fricky, I'm from the press. What do you think of the decision? In all my years on the bench, in all my experience as a lawyer and judge, this is the most incomprehensible verdict that has ever come to my notice. It is utterly unbelievable that any group of men and women could be so swayed by the words of witnesses and attorneys, so spellbound and hypnotized by the mass mind as to permit themselves to run this such a verdict as this. It is not in the power of the people to appeal this case. So nothing remains but to abide by the verdict as returned by the jury. in the 
the office of Captain of Detectives Edwards, we find Edwards in conference with officers Shadrick, Garrett, O'Connor, and Fred Wessel. Well, boys, there you are. None of us had the faintest idea that Rogers would beat that murder rap. What's the next move, Cap? Well, the DA's got a hold on him for those two robberies. And there's a charge of possession of a sap hanging over him. Now, I want you, Wessel, and you, O'Connor, to get busy and hang those robberies on that bird. And I don't want any slip-ups. Starch, you and Shattuck stay on this. And see that we get enough evidence to make these charges stick. Okay, Chief. Who's going to represent us on the case? Cliff Crail. You'll work with him in preparing the case. We want those witnesses who were at the murder trial, but who didn't get a chance to testify. We're going to make this case airtight. Rogers was again brought to trial, first on a charge of possessing a sap or blackjack. Conviction followed on this charge in spite of the testimony of witnesses. Then began the robbery trial. For the March 25th crime, Rogers prepared a puncture-proof alibi. Witness after witness testified to seeing him that night. And also on the night of December 7th, 1929, the date of the first streetcar holdup. Finally, on September 11th, the defense called its last alibi witness, Rosamond O'Keefe. Miss O'Keefe, do you know the defendant? I have met him. Uh, calling your attention to the night of December 7th, did you have occasion to see the defendant that night? Yes, I did. And uh, where did you see him? At the Cosmo Country Club. I danced with him. Mm, what time was that? Mm, it must have been shortly after nine. I got there just a little before nine. They were dancing then. Uh, what time did you leave? After twelve. You say the defendant came in a little after nine? Yes. And remained there steadily till you went home? Yes. Your witness, Mr. Crail. You uh, did not go to this dance with the defendant, did you? No. You just met the defendant that night, did you? No. I had met him once before. When? About two years ago. Where? At Miss Gilmore's house. The girl who testified just before you did? Yes. Can you fix the time of this meeting? No. The day? No. The week? No. The month? No. Are you sure you did meet him? No. I mean, yes. Make up your mind. Yes. But you did see the defendant on the night of December the 7th? Yes. Well, now how do you fix the time so definitely if you cannot remember other dates? When it was called to my attention, I looked it up. Hmm. I had my date yet. My date to the dance. Who called it to your attention? Miss Gilmore. Does that uh, bid bear the date of the dance? Yes, it does. Did you bring it with you? No, I left it at home. Uh-huh. Is this the only dance you ever attended at which the defendant was present? Yes. Are you positive of that? Yes. Your Honor, I request that this girl be sent home with an officer. That she be ordered to bring to the court this bid of which he speaks. Has counsel any objection? None, Your Honor. That it is so ordered. Rosamond O'Keefe was taken to her home. What happened when her Irish mother discovered what was taking place still brings smiles to the faces of the investigating officers. A much chastened Rosamond returned to the afternoon session of court. Direct examination was begun by Deputy District Attorney Clifford Crail. Miss O'Keefe, you testified this morning that you attended a dance at the Cosmo Country Club on the night of December the 7th, 1929. Yes. And that during the evening you saw the defendant, Rogers, and you danced with him. Yes. That was substantially your testimony. Yes. Now, was that testimony true or false? It is false. What was your answer? It is false. It is false. Miss O'Keefe, I'll ask you whether or not last Monday you talked to Evelyn Kilmore over the telephone, that during that conversation that she said to you substantially that you were going to be uh, called as a witness in this case, that you would testify that you had danced with Glenn Rogers at the Cosmo Country Club on the night of December the 7th, 1929. Yes, that is right. She told you that? Yes. If Your Honor, please, for the purpose of the record, at this time, I'd like to stipulate that as far as counsel for defense is concerned, he had nothing to do with putting on what is apparent as perjured testimony. And my investigation completely exonerates him from having anything to do with it. Let the record so show. <laughs> In 
tried of alibis presented by the defense, Glenn Rogers was found guilty of robbery in the first degree. Have you ever seen a long freight train toiling up a mountain grade? Figure for yourself the power required, the lubricant, that must be used to overcome the tremendous friction. It is significant that 52 of the great railway systems of this country depend on Sinclair motor oils to fight friction and wear in their equipment. That fact is as fine an endorsement as any product could have. But that is not all. Add to that the preference of 150 airlines, airplane manufacturers, and flying fields. Everyone knows how vital lubrication is in the business of flying. In addition, millions of motorists in 45 countries say Sinclair in dozens of different languages to express their choice of motor oil. Bear in mind that the motor oil you put in your car is the one thing that prevents moving metal parts from coming together. The one thing most important in safeguarding your motor investment. Make that oil the best you can buy. Sinclair. Sinclair Opaline is only 25 cents a quart at your Rio Grande dealer. It's the qualified companion product of Rio Grande Cracked Gasoline. You should get them both at your Rio Grande dealers tomorrow. And now again we hear Chief Davis. Through circumstances over which the police department had no control, Glenn Rogers was never punished for the cold-blooded shooting of a police officer. He was sentenced, however, to consecutive terms, five years to life and seven years to life on charges of robbery. Efforts are now being made to free this man and again enable him to prey upon society. Cancellation broadcast 191 regarding a holdup. Suspect in this case is now in custody. And that's all. Rolls and quotes. Good night for Rio Grande.